God be with you. Welcome to Hillhurst United Church this morning. Special welcome to those of you who decided that with time change, they're staying in bed wherever you are. Uh, people in different parts of the country and around the world. And what's, what's one of the great gifts that COVID brought us is the opportunity to connect and be in various places. But there are those of you who are here in the pews, in particular the choir who've been here for well, an hour now preparing for this day. So we welcome you to the service today. There are, uh, this is a church that had a banner up front that says, whoever you are, wherever you're at, join us on the journey. And you did. I don't know about you, I find the time change Sunday really tough. Everybody's a little bit tired. Everybody's very grumpy. And it lasts about a week. So let's try to be tired together, but not too grumpy as we come together. To help you with the grumpiness, uh, we have hospitality. And there is coffee there that will keep you propped up and awake uh, for this service. Uh, also uh, and, uh, around hospitality is our blend dinners, which are coming up. And the blend dinners are, for those of you in the building, you're welcome online to see as well, are opportunities along the walls. People are hosting a themed dinner, inviting you to come as a fundraiser uh, for us. And so there's opportunities to eat in different people's home. Go online, there's even one coming up for people online to do some kind of virtual dinner together. Hospitality. Spirituality. Uh, spiritual nurture is tomorrow night at uh, 7 o'clock. We'll be looking at 1946, a movie coming up. Uh, also, Mark, oh, I don't mind going back there. Uh, Enneagram workshop. So, uh, this is a really important uh, way of looking at your motivation. So, if you want to know what motivates you, there's nine energies. We all have one dominant one. I do with any couples I marry, they got to do this. And if you're not in a couple, but you're a human being, that's really important because you got to know yourself. And so the most important thing is knowing who you are and what your energy is. It's coming up on the 23rd, 9 to noon, fabulous hospitality, best workshop in the entire world coming your way and encourage you to that. Um, social justice. Sorry? I have a witness. Okay, there you go. And I know couples that say it saved their marriage, and I know individuals that saved their life. So truly a fun morning with Debbie Jagan and I. Okay, social justice. Uh, next week, there's a refugee team meeting. You heard from Don last week. Those who have, like to engage with the very vulnerable people and making this place a home next week at noon. Uh, later this afternoon at 1 o'clock at Knox United Church, uh, the patriarchy on trial is happening at Knox. And also the t-shirts coming up, that's next week as well. If you're creative in any way and you want to help us make our new shirts for the upcoming uh, Pride Parade, etc., they're due next week. Okay, and then the last one I think is called Risk. Uh, and the Risk is today at noon. And you can do this online as well. We are finally going to hear from our renovation team who have a plan for us with the annex, looking at our kitchen, bathrooms, and gym. I'm super excited about it. Uh, as we step into really saying, okay, now we're ready to go. We know it's been off and on for over three years uh, due to COVID and changes in life, uh, but here we are ready to hear, and we welcome you to that meeting today uh, as we look at our renovation. And the last thing is, people are saying, how do I know what's going on? Somebody try this with your phone. Apparently, you can scan this, and you'll get a weekly email to us. Nobody's picking up their phone. It's okay. We'll stay here as long until somebody does it. No. This is a way in which you can get the Hillhurst Happenings. People say, I didn't know about that. Hillhurst Happenings. It comes weekly. You can look at it. We have a very high uh, readership. 1,400 people get it a week. About 800 people open it. That's high. So that tells you all you need to know about our church. It worked. So there you go. Evidence. Ro evidence from row one. Andrea is away today. Uh, we welcome her into that rest she has today. We are an affirming church. The banner here uh, says you belong. Age, stage, religious, not sexual orientation. Uh, whether someone says you don't fit, you belong here. And we trust you feel that way. We're also learning about our, um, our land acknowledgement. And the land acknowledgement today comes from the University of Calgary that says these words. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we work and play in the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, Pakani, and Kainai First Nations, the Satina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation, Alberta, 
5, and 6. So we're learning to discover that. Essentially, that's saying there were people here before us, and we are learning their stories, their traditions, and being about truth and reconciliation. So in the spirit of bad news, guess what I found out this week? No. I have two pairs on me. I got to get hearing aids. I know. I was like, what? And then, huh? Yeah. So all those people who wear hearing aids, we're going to have a support group later, and you can coach me. Oh, there we go. Look at them all. They're hiding. I'm going to go. I called my mother to tell my mother, and she's like, so? Anyway. So I'm grieving today. Uh, The loss of not just sight, but sound. So truly, uh, I don't know why you're here. You don't know why you're here, perhaps, but we are here. You are online, and we trust that in the spirit of connection in this place, we're reminded in this service that we are not alone. And trust that when you look at another person, you think they got it all together, look in the mirror and trust and know that none of us do, but we are together in it. So welcome. Let us come as we light the Christ candle, which will be lit right here. I don't know if the words will appear behind me. They might. I invite you to join me. Once there was... I am the light. Let us draw the circle wide. Let's rise as we come in song. I think Jesus would like that hymn. The entire ministry of Jesus was about drawing the circle wider and including and including and including, especially those who think they're a holdover, think that they're a leftover, those who think they don't belong. Jesus widened the circle and included those who were grieving, those who were lost those who were delighted, those who were celebrating. And the circle is widened by all of us in this place. And so we come, whether we've had a bad week and received bad news, or whether we are delighted with good news we can't wait to share, we draw the circle wide as we draw ourselves in prayer. I invite you to join me in these words and then rest in your own silence 
and your own prayers. Please join me. Creator, in the beginning was the word, the word was love, the actions were grace. May we remember this as we open our hearts today. Wash over us and make us see clearly and live more fully. In silence, we offer confession, concern, and gratitude. As in this silence, we open our hearts and our minds, trusting that you are at our core of our truest self. offer confession things we wished we hadn't done things we wished we hadn't said things we promised we do that we forgot to do and any weight that holds us back from walking and running and dancing we confess some of us offer concern worry or fear about ourselves or someone and we release it to you and others may find a space for gratitude thankful for someone something some place that reminds us who we are and whose we are and helps us know our truest self. So on this day, in this place, in this space, we open our hearts trusting that you, O oh God, know us, you hold us and call us to life. We let go in this prayer and ground ourselves anew as we sing the words Jesus called us to live. church, good temple, good synagogue matters. When people gather in religion, the word religion means to bind. We're bound together in community to hear stories, scripture, song, and silence. And at the core of it is the message that comes from the creator. The message is, yeah, I know you made a mistake. I know you're weighing yourself down. I set you free. You are forgiven. Not only that, you are loved even though you believe you can't possibly be loved because of what someone has said or done to you. So know this, you are forgiven. You are loved and you are set free. So be bound in that knowledge of good religion and then once you have allowed yourself to be set free, take that joy into the world because the world truly needs the love you will provide because of this good news. 
We are loved, forgiven, and set free. May we dare to believe it. And may the world be transformed by it. Amen. That could be the theme song for the holdovers. So we're at an important point in our service at home or online, at home an opportunity to refresh yourself. In this place, uh, a few things you're welcome to. One is uh, hospitality. And as you have a new a coffee and something to touch there, go along the walls. There's opportunities to look at the blend dinner. Uh, you're most welcome to come forward and light a candle. You're also uh, welcome to bring, uh, if you have, don't have one at the back, these are prayers of confession. We're inviting you to write on and then place in here. We'll burn these on our, at our Easter vigil. Uh, they will not be read aloud. An opportunity to make a gift, uh, traditional, non-traditional. Um, I'm forgetting something. Oh, key point. Kids space at the back. They'll take you to kids space. Anybody's welcome to that. But we invite you to move in this place. And really, it's to greet each other, to remind we're not alone. So I invite you to move in this place with hands together. Uh, and the words are simply, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Welcome to this break. Peace be with you.
good morning. As we settle back into our seats, I invite you to feel the floor beneath your feet, feel the pew underneath you, and just take a breath. We're going to sing a refrain together. This is, I will never forget to you, my people. And we're just going to keep singing it until it's living in our body and living in our spirits. Okay, great. Could you help us out by playing it through once for us, please? feel comfortable. I think we're at the prayers. Uh, now invite us to this refrain. You know, we do these songs, whether it's I Will Never Forget You, maybe that'll pop back in your mind during the week when you're stuck in traffic or you can't sleep, or this one, a way in which uh, through song we breathe and connect and recenter. And so invite us to sing this through once so you know this piece as well. places to remember today. Give thanks for you all showing up super early today in your piece of music. People in places. I remember Susan Cooper, whose husband Steve died this past week, and that funeral will be held this coming week in Cochrane. 
people and places. Pray for Dan and Mary Lane. Uh, surgery this week and gratitude for uh, the health uh, workers in our city, people, places. For those who have emailed and asked for prayers, the prayer group that meet to share them together. For the Carter family and the loss of baby Emmy. What's the last name? Valerie Connors and a death that they've had in their family. Gratitude for being 71. Laura, welcome back. For the process of our Nigerian families who come here at 1045, who are in the process of making this home. Sometimes prayers pop out. Sometimes they remain within. They are still prayers that connect us, invite us to this song and some silence. Let us sing. Spirit moved over the waters and created life. The stars, the galaxies, the planets. And on this planet, the mountains and valleys, rivers and oceans, carved by your spirit, diverse and different. And in all that you said, it is good, very good. Give thanks for the planet and the places that nourish us as home. Places that remind us we belong and we are connected. Pray this day for those who feel like they're a holdover, forgotten, left out, left behind. Sometimes by our own choosing, sometimes by the choices of others. May each know they are not alone. May we be the grace that comes with assurance, with words, with touch, with silence. We pray this day for those ill of body, those who are in hospice or hospital or at home, and for their caregivers. Pray for those who feel like they are shut out. May this religious, spiritual experience remind them they are in and all belong. And so now we rest in our own prayers, our own silence as we listen and open our heart praying for ourselves, for others, for your world. May your fierce and tender love come alive in our living as we pray.
continue to pray. As we let go, as we offer names and places and spaces, may we, in the beating of our heart, trust and know your heart beats with ours, and we are not alone. And may this knowledge give us courage and compassion to love ourselves and live more fully, gathering all our prayers together as we sing. scripture reading today. As she comes, just a reminder to all of you that on Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, our second campus living spirit, an opportunity for gathering and worship and then to eat together. And so an opportunity, 6 o'clock on Wednesday. I say that because Anne and Doug make their way from Pritis, so it cuts their 40-minute drive in half to be there on Wednesday night. A reading of the gospel according to Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. The parable of the prodigal and his brother. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, Give me the share of the wealth that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant region. And there he squandered his wealth and desolate living when he had spent everything. A severe famine took place throughout that region, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the region, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. And no one, no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and more to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of those hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. 
But while he was still far off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and gave him a kiss. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring a robe, the best robe, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the field and he came and approached the house. He heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what was going on? He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted cow because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never, ever disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Holy Spirit, help us to hear the story of these two brothers. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> um, if you haven't seen The Holdovers, it's a story that takes place in a boys' high school, uh, private school and it's written in the 70s. Uh, and as I thought about a question for the day, I was thinking, everybody has a different experience of what their school days were like. So I'm gonna invite you with somebody near you. If you're alone, you're welcome to get up and move wherever you like. If you don't wanna do that, that's fine. But really, what were your school years like? Where, and you can pick any uh, section of that or where they like and just share a bit of a story. Make sure it's a conversation. So we got a minute and a half. What was your school years like?
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call it there. <laughs> School years uh, to be continued. I just had a flashback to being in the principal's office, so we're going to move on. Uh, Rihanna's going to come forward. Uh, Rihanna, I just asked her. She's been here. This is number seven, six or seven Sundays, uh, and she was uh, came for the first time on Monday night to spiritual nurture, and I asked her after, "Do you want to tell us what your take on the movie is?" So I invite you to come forward. Rihanna, and what she said to me is, remember you told me the first time I came here to come six or seven times to see if you really want to be here. Uh, so we're glad, you, we're glad you're here today anyway. So, Rihanna, welcome. Oh, yeah, we need a mic. Uh, okay, I'm picking one up. Oh, yeah, you need one. We welcome people online. She's got this one. Does that work? Yeah, can you hear me? There you go. Good morning. <clears throat> So yeah, I've been here seven times now and already being put to work. That's, that's great. <laughs> um, so I haven't asked to talk about what this movie meant to me personally. A movie about how three culturally diverse, trauma-inflicted individuals became a family over the holiday season. How many of you have seen the movie? Okay, great. I'll start off by saying you don't get the sense from the movie that being a, a, a holdover is in any way a good thing. It's the equivalent of being left behind or possibly forgotten. The three characters are literally being held over during the Christmas holiday in an otherwise empty New England elite academy. For me, the title symbolizes how Paul, Angus, and Mary all seem to be chronically held over, though, in life, unable to move forward, each holding over unresolved issues and traumas that continue to influence their current lives. Paul Hunan, the Academy's uncharitable but pretty adorable history teacher, is held over by his unfair expulsion from Harvard, which seems to have stunted any hope for his emotional or professional growth. Problem student Angus Tully struggles with his father's mental health condition, leaving him feeling deserted, distorting his choices and outlook on life. And cafeteria manager Mary Lamb is similarly held over by her grief for her son, keeping her stuck in the past and at times incapable of fully embracing the present. Each have endured traumatic experiences, the trauma of which is only magnified because they have been and remain alone with their pain. This speaks deeply to me as someone who works, for traumatized, works with traumatized individuals. I work with the chronically held over. I see firsthand how people are able to work through terrible experiences if they have connection and support. But trauma becomes trauma when you are left alone with the trauma. The film almost suggests connecting deeply with others as a prevention strategy, a way you might mitigate risk of a terrible experience becoming traumatic. The answer is connection. Paul, in a particular way, may as well be seen as the exact type of a person suffering from our current epidemic of loneliness or isolation, decades before anybody was even talking about it. For me, the holdover serves as a reminder that we live and die according to the relationships we forge, however temporary they may be. Tonight's the 96 Academy Awards, and although I don't think the holdovers will win, it should. Although there are many important themes of mental health, privilege and disadvantage, nuclear versus chosen family. How wonderful is it that connection leads to self-sacrifice as Paul sacrifices his own welfare for Angus. In the end, it all comes down to loving your neighbor as yourself. I remember growing up in the 70s when a movie was held over. That was a good thing. Do you remember when Star Wars or Greece was held over? Woohoo! You might get to see that movie again. It was a good thing. When I first came to Hillhurst seven weeks ago, I had a short conversation with someone. I think her name was Shannon. New here, she asked me. Mm hmm mm hmm Church shopping, I told her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all done it. Well, 
good luck with that, she said. You'll end up back here. <laughs> well, I never did end up shopping. I, too, kind of got held over at this church week after week. And that's been a good thing. As the three characters in this film head in different directions after the holiday break, they aren't completely healed, but seem to be a bit more at peace with themselves. Perhaps that is what The Holdovers is about, finding people who help us heal parts of ourselves on our journey through life. Thank you very much. Thank you, great, thank you. Thanks so much, wonderful. Okay, I didn't have time to be a, a short sermon, so just let you know, it's a little longer, but there you go, daydream all you want, let's pray. Wow. Wow. May the words of my mouth, the meditation and daydreaming of all our hearts heal us, hold us, and remind us we are held. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful uh, message and reminder. I went to this movie for the first time at Christmas with my 26-year-old uh, daughter. It's kind of like Wonderful Life, a Christmas movie, black and white. This is 1970. It's kind of grainy. It's about dysfunctional families and problems at Christmas and what happens. And you wait endlessly for redemption, and indeed it comes. When I said to my daughter after, what was the movie about? She said, it's all about empathy. Last week, I went with my 13-year-old daughter, and we came in, and we sat down. Here's a funny thing. It has nothing to do with the movie. We go in. There's, we go down the street here. There's six people in the theater. We go in. She parks us in the middle. We're sitting there. Three people come in and sit right in front of us <laughs> with a big hat. And I'm like, loved, forgiven, set free. <laughs> so anyway, we get up and move. But who does that? Anyway, we watched the movie, my 13-year-old, when I said what it was about, she goes, Dad, it's about don't judge a book by its cover. Part of me feels like saying, there you go, these two have said it, let's go, and you've added yours where we are. The story's in the 1970s at a Barton uh, all-boys school, and these are holdovers, people who have to stay over while everybody else leaves to go away for Christmas. Paul Giamatti, who I bet will win Best Actor tonight, is Mr. Hunman. He's a curmudgeon. He calls his students lazy, vulgar Philistines. His t-shirt, which he would love to wear, is no pain, no gain. He lives by the rule book and loves to slap it down at every opportunity. He sucks the joy out of teaching and loves it as he does it. But he has punished himself because he is asked to be the one that supervises the students who are held over because he would not pass a student whose parents would give a major donation to the school. He refused to break the rule and gave them the grade that caused a failure. So Paul, the teacher, is a holdover. Secondly, Tully, or Angus, a kid who's smart and depressed. He's a bit of a misfit, bullied by others in the school. He's a holdover because his parents, uh, his mother and new husband are going off on their honeymoon and they need that break at Christmas. And he's a problem kid who is held back. He's a holdover. And then there's Mary, as you heard a moment ago, a black woman, a cook, who cooks at the school so that her son can come get educated in this white privileged school only to have him graduate and go off to Vietnam and be killed. And he and she, she, I'm sorry, is in grief. Another holdover. So you have these holdovers as a trio held over. At the beginning of the movie, there, there are more kids than just Tully. There's a Mormon kid whose parents are off on a mission. There's a Korean kid who says it's too far away to come home. And there's a rich kid who's had an argument with his father about the length of his hair. And so there they are as the students with both Paul and Mary. But the main trio of this movie is Tully, Mary, and Hunman. They're there linked by depression, grief, and sadness or disappointment. And they are the holdovers. I think the movie takes a break partway through when one of the students, or Tully, is running away from the teacher and he runs through the gym and jumps on a board and flips and breaks his arm, ends up in the hospital. And now here, uh, Tully, the student and the teacher are there. What do we do about this broken arm that I am responsible for because I was supposed to be watching you? 
and the student lies about what's happened and the teacher is saved. So in a sense, these begin then to be the chosen family. Here we are stuck together. How will we be? And Mary, I love it's Mary at Christmas, says, let's make this Christmas for this kid. And so Tully, taking the wisdom and nudge from her, goes off and buy, rebuys the Christmas tree from the, that had been sold again, brings it back, that Charlie Brown tree, and gets a Christmas present that neither Mary or Tully want, which is a book of meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Who really wants that? Although I would like that book. And Mary creates a beautiful dinner where Tully says, this is the first Christmas I've ever had a meal with all the trimmings. At the end of the meeting, uh, Tully, the teacher says, okay, what do you want to do? I'll grant you one wish, if you will. And Tully says, I want to go to Boston. Well, at first he says, we can't, we can't do that. And then he considers the rule book and says, well, maybe we'll call it a field trip. So off they go on their trip of transformation where stuck in a car and time together, they share their stories of grief and you discover the story behind the story of the character. We see Mary visit her pregnant sister. Here's Mary who's lost her own son, son offering children's clothes to her sister and you see them sharing their stories of life. You see Tully's soft side as he wants to go and visit his father, who previously he said is dead, but he's not dead. He's actually institutionalized with schizophrenia, and he's in his institution, and he breaks away to go and visit his dad, who is lost. And then Mr. Hunman, as he is part of this holiday time with Tully, bumps into an old classmate from Harvard, and he and Tully are standing there when the Harvard sick guy says, so where are you doing now? And he tells the story and lies about what has happened and then tells Tully, the student, that when he was at Harvard, he accidentally hit a kid with his car and was expelled. And so here you have in this place these people whose story of why they're so bitter, why they're so sad and broken comes out when they date the time to hear and tell the stories. You see the rule book softening. You see, in this movie, each is pained with being left, whether it's left through death, left through disease, left by being dropped. They're all holdovers. And yet their experience of sharing their stories of how they were held over in their life, the solidarity binds them one to another, and they realize that they are lost but found. They are dead and alive. And it's a movie about redemption and resurrection. And I wonder to myself if this is our story too. Have you ever been a holdover? Have you ever been left out? Have you ever been forgotten? Is there a part of your story, of course we don't know, that speaks about that holdover place in you? Now, I said in the first uh, sermon, we take real and theology, and that's the movie, and what's the connection with the Bible? Well, there's a connection, because the Bible has what we call macro stories, or archetypal themes that speak to this movie. It's about how the people in Scripture are holdovers. They're all yearning and longing for home. The key story in our window of the people of Exodus who have been slaves and then free suddenly wander for 40 years yearning to go back even to slavery where there's food. They yearn to be home as they have left the promised land. Or the exile in 587 BC where the elite Jewish community are taken to Babylon and they live in exile yearning to return home to their people. They too are holdovers. Or in the song that we sang this morning in the Psalms, I will never forget you, my people. I have carved you on the palm of my hand. Even if these forget, God says, I will never forget you, my people. Well, if you sneak yourself into the New Testament, there's all kinds of people, if you get your nose into that book called the Bible, there's a guy named Zacchaeus who everybody hates, everybody shuns, and yet he is curious 
to see Jesus. And when Jesus is coming to down, he scurries up a tree to get a peek at Jesus. And Jesus sees him out of his corner of his eye and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for dinner. Here's the whole over hanging in a tree who's suddenly the host of Jesus at a table. And Jesus says, salvation has come to your house this day. Salvation, healing, coming. When a holdover sits at your table. Or Jesus' entire ministry is about the lepers. And that day, lepers were put at the edge of the city, beyond the wall. And Jesus is one who's charged with eating and drinking and touching the untouchables. His care for the least, the lost, the lonely, the widows, and the orphans is what gets Jesus in trouble because he breaks the rules of the society. And then finally, the story that Anne read a moment ago, and perhaps you were just daydreaming because you say, yeah, I know that story, but some don't. And it's a beautiful story about a person who goes to their father and says, can I have my inheritance now? Which is essentially said, you're dead to me. And then goes off and, and wastes their money in wild living. And then the scripture says, comes to himself. Consciousness wakes up, goes, oh my gosh, have I got this wrong? Here I am as a Jew with pigs that couldn't be worse. Rehearses his confession as he's walking along the road. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, dad. And as he is rehearsing his confession, he's bowled over by the father who said, I thought you were dead, you were alive. I thought you were lost, you're found. Let's have a party, kill the cow, bring a ring, bring the sandals, it's a feast. And then there's the brother, the other one, who was a holdover at home. And says, what's this? This guy goes off and wastes it all while well, I've stayed here and taken care of your cows and your pigs and your dementia and changed your depends. And he gets a party. And the father says, you've been with me always. You're welcome to this party. I thought he was lost, is found, dead, is alive. You are welcome too. When I thought about this story, I thought, why, oh, why do I dislike the one who stayed home? I don't like the one that stayed home because I'm the one that left. There's some delight in the curiosity of the one who wasted it all, who lived life to the fullest that I admire and respect. But then when I see the one that stayed home, I wonder about the strong loyalty they had to the land and the farm and to their parent. And part of me wonders, what is it that made him stay as a holdover with his father? Have you ever been a holdover? A holdover in your life when you've been the one that stayed and everybody else left and experienced that? You see, we live, as Rihanna said, in a society of disconnection. We live in a society where we're disconnected and disconnected even more. This week, a woman told me about what it was like in her school years to be bullied said she got glasses and then they were very thick glasses as a kid and people called her four eyes, four eyes, four eyes. And even to this day, she still has tears in the corner of her eye as she tells the story of what it's like to being a holdover, someone who's experienced bullying. Social media is clearly another example about how we create old holdovers where we watch people having some party or vacation or dessert and we sit alone and we watch it and the teenage generation, 18 to 24, are experiencing incredible loneliness and depression because of FOMO, not being part of it and feeling disconnected. Or how about divorce? For those of people who have been divorced, there's nothing like being a holdover, whether someone left you or you left them. Both are in pain. Both know what it's like to be left or to be left behind. Or those of you who had someone you love die, what it's like when you've had the service and you've had all your friends and family and an incredible feast and you make your way home and you go into your house and you close the door and you are by yourself for the very first time in your life and the silence is deafening as someone who has died has left you. But what about this combination? And this is something I'm ruminating on death and divorce together. 
I've noticed that when you sit at dinner tables and someone tells the story about someone who's died in their life, there's a certain curiosity and empathy. People say, what happened? And then they usually say, that's so sad, that must be awful. But you notice the elephant in the room they don't talk about, which is divorce. But if divorce comes up, there's a quiet, why? Who screwed up? And the guilt and the shame come upon those who have experienced divorce as people tell stories about what they think happened. And the question is why? So whether you have left or been leaving, you know what it likes to be a holdover. Or just look at Hillhurst United Church. When Andrea told me she was leaving, it was like, oh, because I've been here this summer 20 years. And as I sat there and thought about all the people that came and left here, I felt like a leftover. Joanne, Pam, Susan, Greg, Marsha, Dawn, Robin, Tony, Keith, Alinka, Herman, and Andrea. And when people leave us in our workplace or our churches or our homes, we feel it. It's not their fault. They've left and all gone on to do amazing things, being part of this church to enrich the world, and we're happy. But nonetheless, we feel that sense of what it's like to be a holdover. Have you ever? I'm going to close my eyes and invite you to put up your hand. Have you ever been a holdover? Because the deepest grief is our own. We compare grief, oh, theirs is worse than mine or mine's worse than theirs. But the truth is, I don't care what it is. We all experience what it's like to be a holdover. So holdovers in the Bible and holdovers in our lives, what do they do in this movie that's so exciting to me? It's to see how they take their lives interconnected and help to heal each other. And so there's some homework I'm giving you here. You see in the movie, Mary going the extra mile. She creates a feast for three people. She says to Haman, go get a tree, get a gift. And they go an extra mile for someone. And my homework from this movie for you this week is go the extra mile. Just when you think you're done, think to yourself, I'll go that little bit further for someone else. You have no idea how that text or email, phone call, or touch will matter. Go the extra mile. The second bit of homework is break the rules. Break the rules. Be creative. They have this scene in this movie where the three of them are having dessert or going to have dessert and Tully, who's not able to drink, would like the flaming whatever it is. And they try hard, but the, the waitress says, nope, 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 rule book. So then they order ice cream, cherries, and rum, and they take it out to the hood of the car and they light it on fire and they feast and laugh as they break the rules and they have this. And so I encourage you to find a way to break the rules this week. Or the other one, homework is touch. And it's maybe there's so many times you see people touch and nothing is said. Toward the end of the movie when there is silence because Hunman's getting ripped over by the headmaster and Tully's probably going to get expelled, Mary comes up and sits down on a bench beside him and just gently puts her hand out and they hold their hands. No words are spoken. Sometimes you don't have to say a damn thing. You just have to reach out and touch a hand or a shoulder. I remember a Sunday sitting back here one day, there was a woman weeping. And another person came in and sat behind and just placed their hand on their shoulder, didn't say a word. A lot of times we don't need to say a darn thing. We just got to touch. And the fourth bit of homework, that one's don't speak. The last one is lie when you need to or sacrifice. Because Paul, at the end of the movie, lies so that Tully will remain in school. He takes the blame for something that he didn't do so that another can move on. You see, sacrifice isn't about guilt and shame. Sacrifice is about life-giving choices. In this case, he lied so that another person could stay at school. 
So the homework is go an extra mile, break the rules, touch, don't speak, and sacrifice for another. You know, when you were talking about sacrifice in this movie, I thought to myself about a man named Gerard. Decades ago, I worked for the Quaker Committee on Jails and Justice, and the team, a small group, would go to the jail to meet in the remand center in Toronto, the Don Jail. And these are people who don't know their sentence, all thrown in one place. And we would come into a dark gray room at the jail and we would sit in conversation. That was it. Listen. And this man named Gerard came running right up to me. I'll never forget his face. He sat beside me. He said, I learned a lot in this place, you know. I learned so many things you won't believe. This is a terrible place, this place. And then he said, but I learned one thing. I learned how to kill myself. Do you want to see? I said, no, no, I'm good with that. He said, no, no, I'll show you. And he took off his T-shirt and he began to make a noose. He said, this is all I need, my T-shirt as a noose. He said, but one day I went to chapel here and the chaplain said, we can take anything, any burden, anything we did and we can lay it at the foot of the cross. And when we lay it at the foot of the cross, we are set free. He said, so I took my t-shirt and I laid it at the foot of the cross and I was set free. I know what I did was wrong, but I am set free. You see, Gerard was a holdover too, just like you, just like me. And the other person is Jesus. Jesus was a holdover too. He's on the cross. He goes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm a freaking holdover here. And then Jesus says, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And he dies. And God has the last word. And that word is grace. And he moves on to new life, redemption, resurrection, which is our gift too in this life and the next. So for me, this movie is about all of us who are holdovers, trusting we are not alone. God's amazing grace will wash us and hold us and lift us to walk again. Thanks be to God for this great good news. Amen. I invite you to sing this hymn, which is not a funeral hymn. This is a life
hear this short blessing by John O'Donohue called Coming Home. May all that is unforgiven in you be released. May your fears yield the deepest tranquilities. May all that is unlived in you blossom into a future graced with love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all, go in peace. Amen.